Okay. My name is Edith Delgado. I'm a professor of um, computer security at Iona College in New York. And uh, I'm also the director of the Computer Ethics Study Program. I was in the process of planning a trip, um, a study abroad group for students to examine the environmental, religious, and political intersections um, in Vieques and Venezuelas, and then the hurricane. So I'm, I'm so committed to that study and um, to making the connections among um, religion, politics, and, and the environment. Wow, this is great. This is a. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm an executive committee of the Puerto Rican Studies Association, and I also wanted to ask, are we getting down the names of the people? This is an incredible story. I know, right? That's exactly what I did. out exactly. Are we doing that? We should. Yeah, let's write it right? down. I can, I can have yeah. a... Oh, yeah, perfect. Can you help us with that? Sure. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful. With their name, what they represent, exactly. and their so we can follow up, right? <laughs> Perfect. So we're just going to fill out that one. Just just your name, email address, and the uh, entity you guys are currently working in support of Puerto Rico. All right? Sounds good. Did anyone else come? Oh, you, right. planning for those disasters like Maria. Um, been doing planning for about 18 years and before that I was uh, a member of the Puerto Rico Planning Board under Governor Aníbal Acevedo Vila and President of the Puerto Rico Planning Board under Governor Luis Jorge. And I'm very glad to be here. Hey, Ruth, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ruth, can you say a few words so we can test the, the audio? Okay, hi, how good morning to everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Okay. <laughs> so my name is Brenda Torres. I'm a social ecologist. I'm currently managing the San Juan Bay National History Program. We're part of a network of two uh, that are uh, uh, highly important and ecological important as well. We are um, currently, um, we've, been, we've been trying to restore the quality of the water from this watershed for the past 25 years, and we were actually making strong progress. Uh, but with this hurricane, of course, there's a lot of impact. Um, the, the, the mangrove forest and the system was very resilient, but uh, the aftermath is what's really impacting the, the estuary system. And estuary is where the salt water. Um, you know, mixes with the uh, fresh water. Um, it's that area. So, you know, therefore, the entire metropolitan area, that whole basin, it's, uh, it's part of the estuary. It runs from Guapaja all the way to Lois Piñones. Mm -hmm. So, it's a 97 square mile watershed uh, that is currently lacking of sewer infrastructure. And of course, all of that is draining. Um, in these waters that are very important um, from the tourism perspective, from ec ecological perspective. So we, we you know, we're actively working to see what we can do to, to support the government and support the communities and support the private sector. Um, it's a delicate dance, but we're working on that. And I was asked to, to moderate this panel related to environment. I think you all would be environmental conservation and restoration for the past 30 years so um, this is my field and I, and I 
really, I'm so happy to have a very diverse group um, with us. And as well as we have Luz Santiago, who's joining us from Puerto Rico. Uh, thanks to Foundation for Puerto Rico that actually um, allows her to, to be in a place where there is Wi-Fi and it's comfy with AC, uh, which is also lacking um, these days in Puerto Rico. So, hola, Ruth. Hi. Hello, everyone. Hello. Uh, well, Ruth uh, wears many hats, um, but this time she uh, she's wearing the hat of the El Puente, Enlace Latino de Acción Climática. Latino Climate Action Network. It's a super strong and cool initiative. Um, and so she's going to talk about it and then talk about the community work that she's been doing for the past year, and especially now. Adrián Cerezo. Adrián Cerezo and I have also been involved for many years in the past. Um, I think it was maybe 15 years ago yeah. that we saw each other um, when I was actually managing this program back in Puerto Rico. And um, Adrian brings um, a lot of uh, good ideas and experiences. I mean, he's been working um, in the uh, international conservation arena for for these past 15 years, and he can tell us and, and his guide us I mean, on how to develop a good uh, format for the Congress and the electoral officials to better understand what the, are the priorities in terms of ecological restoration. Um, He's also a professor at the Yale School of Forestry. We have Ana Maria, Ana Maria Carrion, um, who's the development director of a very, very important organization called the Para la Naturaleza. And Para la Naturaleza has around what, 60, 60 mm -hmm. um, uh, national protected areas uh, that are also of historical value. Uh, the effectiveness of this organization is something that I want you guys to um, learn about. She's going to talk um, about the way she's been providing relief so that, you know, to the community so that the community can actually provide some support to the rebuilding process of these um, areas, the natural protected areas that are um, in Puerto Rico. So without further, I can just start, right? <laughs> Ruth, um, should we start with you? Okay, sure. Um, so, hello again. Everyone, um, I would like to address uh, sort of what we've been working on with El Puente uh, and the Latino Climate Action Network and Lasa Latino Action Climatica for the past two and a half years here in Puerto Rico, which has to do with the energy grid. And as most of you probably know, uh, and Brenda, please keep me to my time um, because uh, I could go on for a while. But um, most of you know that energy generation uh, in most countries and including in Puerto Rico is the primary source of environmental contamination, right? So we have the um, toxic release inventory that EPA publishes, which indicates that that is exactly the case in Puerto Rico. And so the, for example, the Aguirre Power Complex in Salinas, where I live, and the uh, AES um, coal burning power plant in Guayana, very close nearby, both pretty much on Hobos Bay, are the number one and two generators of uh, toxic uh, emissions in Puerto Rico. And that has to do with air emissions and also, I mean, of course, we have to consider water discharges and land issues, uh, especially AES coal ash or coal combustion waste that uh, as many of you have heard, has been piled up in a mountain um, in Guayama, Puerto Rico, at the plant site that impacts the um, Bay communities and beyond because it's it's been um, trucked to Peñuelas and also to Umacao even more, right, to the landfills there. And prior to that, it was being used as fill material at construction sites, mostly in southeastern Puerto Rico, but uh, also in other places. Um, so I, I think I should go back and just give a little background about um, the Puerto Rico Electric Power Authority and how um, in spite of, you know, the situations that we're facing with it now, we should acknowledge that it, it, it was um, sort of the engine that powered the, the electric, electrification of all of Puerto Rico. And we all know of course, that Puerto Rico is a volcanic island with a very complex geography, with especially the Central Mountain Range and how PREPA 
workers um, at one time were really well known for being able to place um, energy transmission infrastructure in very difficult terrain, right? In the mountains, um, crossing, um, uh, you know, the, the, the forest, the dense tropical forest, et cetera. And that, that PREPA played a huge role in what is the industrialization of Puerto Rico today, that uh, although now we're hearing a lot about the debt crisis, the fiscal crisis, the economic crisis, and lately, of course, the Maria crisis, the Hurricane Maria devastation, um, we need to keep in mind that Puerto Rico um, has um, an economy that produces lots of profit, quite frankly, for big pharma, right? Big pharmaceutical industries. I mean, uh, we produce here in Guayana uh, at one of the big pharma plants, all of the Advil and many other products for um, you know, the, the U.S. market etc. We have um, a thriving genetically modified uh, organism agro industry, especially in this area. And, and all of that is powered by PREPA and the uh, uh, private power purchase agreements that are, are um, in place between PREPA and uh, AES Corporation, the coal converting power plant, and um, Ecoelectrica in, in Guayanilla, right? Um, so, uh, in other words, the, the industrialization process that has sort of distinguished Puerto Rico from other islands in the Caribbean, that you know, and the fact that we have um, uh, lots of industrial uh, development has been largely powered by, by PREPA. But um, with the onslaught of the Hurricane Maria, right, um, and the aftermath, well, we've had, and, and, and obviously even before, we've had serious problems with PREPA. Um, and uh, not just the communities that, that I've worked with forever in terms of uh, Hobos Bay, um, but also, um, you know, that now we're seeing increasingly that energy to San Juan and, and the population centers in the metropolitan area are being affected by the lack of um, uh, power that we're, we're not getting because, um, in part because the transmission lines, the, the whole transmission system, or at least 80% is, is down, or the, although, well, uh, there's been some, some work on it. Um, and so the lessons I think that we can take away from this particular experience, I would say number one, um, that we, we have now internalized that Puerto Rico is and uh, a part of a, a continent of islands, but not a continent, right? We don't have, we're an islanded electric grid and we do not have interconnection to other jurisdictions as is the case with um, electric grids in the states where they're more or less interconnected except of course, Texas. And um, so we are part of the Caribbean where, um, we're also subject to hurricanes, right? We're on, we're on the route, the primary highway for hurricanes. And um, another a lesson that stems from that is that um, uh, vertical poles and cable lines, transmission lines, don't look well during hurricanes, right? We've, we've seen that 80% basically of the transmission and distribution system have gone down with Maria. And also trees and transmission and distribution systems don't, don't mix, as um, Gretchen Bakke has said in, in her book uh, entitled The Grid. And, and that's true almost everywhere, right? Um, trees were the cause of the 2003 blackout in the U.S. The, in, on the eastern seaboard. Um, so now that we have other options, you know, maybe we can go to those. We think, um, from what I've seen, for example, Solar, um, solar arrays um, have held up better. Um, although uh, the array in Punta Lima, in Jabucoa, where basically Jabucoa, Macau, where, where Hurricane Maria made landfall, um, that, that was pretty impacted. But if you look further away, like for example, in Salinas, the, the Horizon Energy or Equian Energy Array is intact, unscathed, untouched. And um, so 
we think that, that solar would be a better option for Puerto Rico, obviously, in, in terms of resiliency. Um, another thing I think we've learned from the aftermath of Hurricane Maria is what some people have called the golden triangle holds true in the sense that um, we are seeing contracts, uh, the, the great concern about contracts that are being handed out for building the grid in the same way, right? Not transforming it as we think it should be to a more resilient rooftop solar kind of grid that is uh, closer to the load centers, that is to the San Juan metropolitan area, um, solar communities, and, um, and, and first and foremost, energy literacy. How do we um, learn to transform our electric system in our daily lives and how, how we're using it? Um, this is what we've been working on with uh, the communities, uh, Holos Bay communities in Coqui, in Salinas, and with the professors at the University of Puerto Rico in Mayaguez and other, uh, other um uh, other alliances that we've made. So I'll, I'll leave it at that for the time being. Thank you. still assessing the real impact 
of what these hurricanes have done. And um, but we decided that um, even though we're an environmental organization and people know us from the environmental side, that we needed to take care of our communities. Mm -hmm. So the first, um, we had a three-front plan that we've implemented, and the first part is direct aid, which is what a lot of organizations in the front have been doing. And uh, we have communities that are even within our natural protected areas. These are communities we work with on a day-to-day -day basis, and they've, you know, we've, they've been with us um, for years and years. So right now, we've basically decided that we need to take you know, we've always taken care of each other, but more than ever right now, we've kind of um, gone outside of our regular activities to go and take them water, take them necessities, basic supplies, what everyone has been doing, we've been doing it with them. We've decided, because it's so much, to focus on 30 different communities. We've actually gone up on 20 that we originally have to 30. We're working with many more outside of the 30 but we're fully impacting um, 30 communities around our nature reserves. The second part of our plan is to really try to help um, the agriculture side. As you all know, you know, and the, the, um, we're very, very involved with um, the um, agroecological farmers, and uh, we've decided that we have to stand up and help that side of our, of our um, economy. Um, it was got taken off tremendously, and the impact that we're seeing in that area is devastating. Mm -hmm. So right. we are planning on taking a very um, solid role to try to help um, farmers in Puerto Rico. And the third part of it, which will be coming out once the humanitarian crisis hopefully is being addressed, we're going to launch, we launched last year, we're going to augment, to use the word that someone used earlier today, our reforestation um, efforts. Uh, reforestation is a big part of what we do, um, but now we will be, we are in the process of really determining a solid plan. We, next week actually, we are having a, a quarter of communities on, on this topic to really determine how we're going to go about the next few years. It's not going to, this is a long-term plan that we're going to be launching on reforestation and uh, going outside of our usual boundaries which are within our nature research and see how we collaborate with other organizations in this topic. Um, I'll finish by saying that you know our short and mid-term plans are basically um, definitely addressing the community needs at this point. Um, we've realized just like Luke was saying earlier, um, we while energy is not something that we deal with on a daily basis, we do obviously renewable energy is important within our sites. Most of our sites are basically have solar panels, we have water uh, collection systems, etc. in most of our sites. But right now what we're seeing is that we have to collaborate with other organizations that we already be in contact from left and right to really look into this area and learn from this um, and implement um, basically uh, work with our communities so they can become more sustainable in this area. Um, the, obviously, the other big area that we are looking in the immediate, mid, and long-term area is water, clean water, that we were about to launch a strategic plan, which has been uh, affected a little bit by all of this because we might need to shift some things around, but water is an extremely important area for us. And uh, um, Brenda and the estuary and Para Naturaleza have been working hand in hand in this area, and obviously, if you don't have clean water, Health is going to be affected if you don't have clean water. Tourism is going to be affected if you don't have clean water. You know, many things are going to be affected. And um, uh, uh, the la the, on the long term, obviously, we need to look at economic development. Um, I will talk a little bit more about that. I know Adrian is going to be talking a little bit about this too. But, you know, as they were saying earlier, our economy was already in crisis. And now we really need to look at how we're going to, you know, move. Um, move ahead and, and then levantarnos from this. So economic development through agriculture, sewer forestation through different areas, green jobs are extremely important for us. Um, as I say, energy with regards to sustainability and the agroecological part of it. So um, we'll talk a little bit more about how we can all have a part on this, but um, that's pretty much the idea. Perfect. Um, I'm going to take 
take a kind of a curve here in uh, Virginia <laughs> for those of you. Um, so I, I work in global policies and I, I am very interested in the questions of um, what, what are the differences between problems and consequences. Just, just to pause um, very quickly, um, I know people are following us and they're interested in, in sorry, no? in um, finding out what the hashtag is or the Twitter account for Para Naturaleza, what's the name of the Twitter account? Um, para la naturaleza. It's a. para la naturaleza without the A. And then I am Estuario San Juan and Adrián is, he doesn't have any. <laughs> <laughs> He's old school. Um, and Ruth, do you have any, um, do we need, uh, Lace, Lace Latino Acción Climeta has a Twitter account? Yeah, I'm sure we do, but uh, you'd have to ask David Ortiz for it. I'm sorry. I created it um, a couple of years ago, but I'll, I'll remember. Okay. Go ahead. Sorry, I have no social media presence. <laughs> but it's not because I'm old school, it's just I don't like no? to talk to people. Um. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I look at uh, global systems, I look at hypercomplexity, and I think a lot about sustainable development. And I would like to begin my, my notes because that's basically what I want to do. Uh, present some notes uh, that can fit the conversation, uh, saying that what we're talking about here is the consequences, a lot of consequences. Uh, and so the, that is an important statement because what, what we're trying to think of as solutions are mostly ways of attending to an emergency that is really consequences. Uh, that's why I have focused a lot of my attention to the Sustainable Development Goals, which is a document that was adopted by the United Nations in 2015 out of a 20-year process that is the baby of a 50-year-old process that answers the question, what is environment? Because this is a panel about environment, and in 1972, we told ourselves, all of the people that were working on wildlife conservation and issues of pollution, that we will never take care of the environment until we take care of each other. And so the first conference on humans and the environment asked the question, what does that mean? And the most sophisticated answer to that question is the 17 goals that were expressed by the United Nations in 2015, putting together a very sophisticated, well thought out blueprint of what does the world look like if we get our act together. And it certainly includes issues of uh, wildlife conservation and marine ecosystems and climate change, but it also has to do with economics. It also has to do with infrastructure. It also has to do with health. It also has to do with education, nutrition, poverty, gender issues. So when we, when we think about what's happening in Puerto Rico right now, and again, I'm sort of trying to moderate my intensity because <laughs> I am Puerto Rican, I was born and I grew up in Puerto Rico, so I'm experiencing the trauma of the, of the disaster mm -hmm. as a person. But as a scholar, I am trying to think through what, are, what is a way of using this opportunity that, is, that has been presented to us by this disaster to, build, to put together the building blocks towards a future of sustainable development in Puerto Rico. And I'm not thinking about it in this sort of uh, find the sky way where let's forget about the disaster because that's, that cannot be done. Especially if there's anybody listening from Puerto Rico, I understand that there are urgent matters to be taken care of. So this is a process of one plus the other. And it's a process of being strategic and from the very beginning of attending to this crisis, trying to figure out what are the uh, interventions that can be done right now to attend to the crisis and the recovery that can set us on a pathway towards sustainable development. Mm -hmm. And we as scholars that are not in Puerto Rico, um, the group that I'm working out of at Yale University at the School of Forestry, um, and I should point out that I'm a researcher at the Ziegler Center for Early Childhood Development, where I am a global policy scholar, so <laughs> we, we can get into that later. But um, but I'm a social ecologist as well, and our group at the School of Forestry is putting together a, a course and a kind of practicum that is called From Recovery to Sustainable Development. And we want both terms to be there 
because that's sort of what, where we want to get into intervening with these issues. How do we build towards a build interventions right now that can set the pathways towards the sustainable development that we want in the future? That is also important in a very practical way because we are getting ready. I mean, the main thrust of this conversation with the diaspora here is how do we shame Congress into allotting the right amount of money into the recovery and the movement forward in Puerto Rico? We're only talking about recovery from the storm. We're talking about putting money into an emergency. The Congress acting as the Red Cross. When we talk about a movement towards sustainable development in a strategic way, we're talking about an investment from Congress into the future of Puerto Rico. And the more that we can do that, the better the chances that we're going to get a larger investment in areas that are not inherently directly related to the things that were damaged by the storm. Uh, I'm looking at you because I, I am a great fan of Comunidades Especiales and the work that they did and the opportunity that is set by thinking about these systems in a cohesive, coherent, large-scale way. All that said, <laughs> when I do this a lot, it means it's a lot. And so one of the things that we do and we have been doing for the last few years, so I don't have a social media anything, it's because we think about hypercomplexity, which doesn't leave a lot of time to talk to people, because we're thinking about larger systems that breach the borders of complexity. <coughs> so we do this a lot. One thing I've learned in giving lectures about this is that it scares the, the Jesus out of people, because it's a lot. And so one thing that I would like to bring to the discussion that is a very practical way of attending this is what we are doing right now and doing it more and better, which is having distributed networks of different organizations that are dealing with different aspects of sustainable development in Puerto Rico, doing their work as well as they can with the resources they have, but keeping in mind that we are building towards a larger, more, a, a larger statement, a larger plan. Because when we're doing that, even if we're not working together, even if we're not necessarily talking to each other, there is a, large, a, a bigger possibility that those uh, actions are going to coalesce uh, with each other. Um, so I'm going to stop here, and then we can talk about other elements of this as we get into the discussion. Yeah. So, um, so thank you so much, Adrian. We heard um, from the climate justice um, perspective, um, also from those that are currently integrating in first response and, and restoration uh, that was from Naturaleza, and also the policy perspective of this situation as to how do we how do we frame this whole thing of you know ecological restoration in a way that is attractive and it relates to the usual um, relief package that is normally discussed or usually discussed at the Congress level. Um, just to put you in perspective, um, within a month, we will be um, hearing a lot about that uh, relief package. Um, in a way, it is my interest to see um, a lot of information there about adaptation, resilience, in a way, like, like you mentioned, Elian, uh, that um, this is not just a burden, but it's also an investment, and it will support um, the communities that are in vulnerable areas, and will support a, a, a sustainable economic um, development for the region. So I wanted to to now um, just what what do you think we should do now? Well, I mean, I think we can do the instructions that were given to us along with not talking about the status was to do a panel discussion, but I kind of feel that we have such a rich participation, such a diverse group here, that if you're all okay, okay, we should open it to a larger conversation conversation with everybody. Yeah, we can just direct. Uh, I wanted to first ask a question um, to everyone, and maybe get 10 responses. Um, when you heard about this uh, hurricane that was just about to, you know, just about to strike Puerto Rico, what came to your mind? What, what first? Uh, what was the first thing that came to your mind? I'm going to ask uh, ten people. 
So, want to raise your hand? Yes. Sorry, I came in uh, late. So this is an early end question, right? My, the question that came to my mind was the work. Oh, just worse, work. Worsening. Worsening. Okay. Who else? Waste. Waste. Okay. Waste. Uh huh. Not ready. Uh huh. Here we go again. <laughs> Just say the words. Vultures, then. Uh huh. Annihilation. What? Annihilation. Huh? Annihilation. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sounds like a birthday card so far. The conservation of life from an animal. Okay, who else? The wind energy. Huh? What, what did you say? The wind energy. Wind energy, like the one that was. I wanted to know if, if it's related to wind uh, power generation. Yes. Okay. yes. Survival. So. Okay. So we have ten. Okay. Dina. Extreme poverty. And Danyaba, can get it. No, that's it. Yeah. Okay. So my my homework, and I think the homework of everyone here um, and those listening right now, is to see. I mean, this is this is a good a good. Uh, this is pretty much what the Congress and others are trying to address currently. Um, it talks about disaster. It talks about catastrophe. So uh, what we want to do in this panel is to see how we can relate each of these you know, issues that we're now confront confronting with ecosystem restoration, with the natural infrastructure. So how does the natural infrastructure support or bring relief to these um, circumstances that we're now living? Uh, that's something just for your uh, put for thoughts uh, something that uh, we we will be um, you know taking into consideration when we write down talking points um, that will hopefully come out of this discussion um, so we can eventually empower the the regular citizens so they can talk to their elected officials and eventually talk to congressional leaders um, and then from there we'll hopefully have strong movement of Puerto Ricans and also uh, environmental leaders um, supporting us um, in this in this fight that, that will begin in, in, in a, within a month. Um, so I can just open for discussions. Any any and then first I thoughts? Say something real quick. I mean, for me, it's funny because um, the way uh, and I guess after the shock of the hurricane, the words that actually are coming to mind all the time, all the time, right now at this point, it's and that they've been said I think by everyone. It's resilient. It's just amazing how resilient we are as, a, as, a, as an island, as a nation, as a, well, I'm not going to get into this, but <laughs> as, you know, and as people and learning from, learning from nature, how resilient nature is and bringing those two together. And to the other one, as, as Adriana had mentioned and everyone has mentioned, is sustainable, sustainability. And I think the key to moving forward I know we've gone through hurricanes before. There have been many, many hurricanes, and I think for people like you that you know really are in that you know deep into all of these issues, I think what's key right now is to really look at everything we've um, suggested in the past, and we really try to see what is, as they were saying earlier, what we can do in the short term and in the mid term, and then in the long term. This is going to happen again. I don't know if it's going to happen the same way, but we all know hurricanes will happen again. So I think it's a matter of really focusing on 
how at this point we're we're being given a horrible and a, and a horrible situation with a golden opportunity to really change our ways. And I want to think I don't want people I don't think people will forget that quickly. So I think we have a critical time right now, and, and this is long term. We have a critical time right now to really make real changes that hopefully in the, in the sustainable, in the, in the environmental world, hope people will listen. Because I think a lot of what happens is that the people, the individuals, are not in touch. They don't realize the impact of their everyday actions, which is a little bit of the work that we do, and how we translate to what's going on right now. So I think this is kind of like the opportunity from taking all of the conversation that we're going to be taking to Congress, definitely, but really make an effort of translating that into the one, you know, the, the kindergarten language where people really understand how can they have an impact and how they need to activate and give them the tools to be able for all of us to come together and really help them with this. Yeah, so further framed as I, I don't know if I agree with a lot of that, and uh, I, I think uh, I, when I was thinking about this, I, um, I was talking to a colleague yesterday, and one of one of the key issues that makes it that makes it a golden opportunity, but also creates a, an, a really important responsibility for all of us mm -hmm. that are looking and working, is that the word experiment has come up very much in my conversations. Mm -hmm about what's going to happen to Puerto Rico. I, I mean, from people in Puerto Rico, from people outside of Puerto Rico, it's a perfect laboratory. I've heard it so many times. Mm -hmm. In the 1960s, Puerto Rico was a perfect laboratory for mm -hmm. birth control. Right. And look what happened. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's not just a matter of translating <laughs> what we're doing in terms of opportunities in language that can be brought to communities. I think there's a lot to talk about there, mm -hmm. but it is about making processes transparent, mm -hmm. making processes aware, so that when we're engaging in those things, we're sure that the choices that we're making are really contributing to this, to the benefit and the well-being of people, not just to the benefit and the well-being of some companies or some interests. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, I'm not saying this with any political interest <coughs> in mind, I'm just saying it because it's something that has already happened, and the thing that allowed that to happen in the past is the lack of transparency and the lack of awareness in the process. So it's not just a process of communication to other people. It's that we are all in the dark here and we all have to figure out how to make this transparent for all of us in so many ways. So from that perspective, I think that's sort of, it's this larger brother, again, I'll do this a lot, brother communication agenda that we have to attend to in order to, to rescue these opportunities that are present today, the ones that are present in two years, and the ones that are present in the next 20 years. Right, Ruth, do you want to react to two other questions? Sure. Um, yeah, I, I'd like to sort of um, continue um, uh, sort of emphasizing the fact that the, the, there was actually a Wall Street Journal article, I don't know how many people saw it, that talked about um, rebuilding PREPA's grid as it is, but um, using Puerto Rico uh, as a place to experiment on materials that would be more, uh, would stand um, hurricane forces in, in building the transmission systems, the poles and the, and the um, power lines. And um, so I, I totally agree with Adrian that uh, Puerto Rico is again being seen as a place for a yet another experiment. And um, I, I think that, that that's certainly not the way to go and that we need to focus on um, education, capacity building, energy literacy, um, demand management programs. I think we have seen here, especially in the communities in Salinas, Guayama, and other, other um, sort of excluded communities in Puerto Rico, that people respond very well to small incentives. And if we had an energy management program where people were incentivized to use as much energy as they need to use during the day as opposed to having a nighttime peak we could very well make big solar um, communities very viable um, with a minimal investment in battery storage systems and the like um, so I mean just very practical considerations that that we have and we're trying to implement with 
the, the communities we're working with and with the alliances um, that we're making. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, as I was listening to everything you were saying, what kept going through my head, <laughs> one is recovery. When do we stop recovery and when do we change over to um, sustainability? Okay, because right now, I'm torn. I mean, I think all of us are torn. The, uh, the other thing is to make, it's very important that the island people, and I'm Puerto Rican too, is that we are as we are very important to the island right now. We are key to its survival. And I think we need to relay that across. You can't separate us anymore. Or you know, that can't that can exist. Mm -hmm. And my heart is in the island, you know, for Maria, even though I grew up here. I say I, I cry, I it, no 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 so you know, I know that. But you know, one of the things is how do we build from um, from recovery to uh, what was the word you used? Sustainability. Sustainability. Right now, when do we stop? Because the recovery is still is still not there. I mean, do you see it occurring within a year? Is it recovery? The recovery, or are we going to have both of them going on at the same time? And how do we do that? Well, I mean, can, we, if we can chew gum and walk at the same time, I think we can attend to the emergency and move towards sustainability at the same time. The question is, how do we make sure that all the elements that are contributing to that are contributing to, to a, a general project, a shared project, rather than many different projects? And how do we? figure out how to talk to each other well enough so that we can do that not together because I think diversity is more important than togetherness here. Mm -hmm. Having many voices that can at least acknowledge each other might be more important than getting everybody on board on the same project. Mm -hmm. So, and I know that sounds uh, complicated, <laughs> contradictory, but it isn't. I, I think diverse, the, this is the moment where we benefit from the diversity. Look at this panel. And we are all from Puerto Rico. And just like us, there are people here that do so many different things. And we have we don't know each other, most of us. And we haven't worked together yet. But there is an opportunity that we can all contribute to this project without even liking each other, maybe. <laughs> and, and I want to say just before before we don't, we have one and another question, those two. Uh, but before we do um, move forward, I wanted to mention there is a precedent um, Congress level um, when they passed the, the Sandy Storm um, mm -hmm. Relief Package, for example, mm -hmm. is a relief package that actually contemplated, um, you know, the words resilience, the words mm -hmm. obviously this is not going to happen now, kind of changed, but it was something mm -hmm. there. Um, and uh, adaptation and other words that are key for us to um, ensure that the recovery process is actually done in a sustainable way. Um, so it has happened in the United States, um, mm -hmm. and it has proven to be effective. So it's something that we're definitely that same um, framework. We will, we are currently evaluating mm -hmm. and, um, and proposing um, ways for for the, the leaders of the congressional levels to incorporate those as well. So Frankie, um, uh, I, I guess that we all agree that uh, um, that we need sustainable growth uh, green policies. Uh, what worries me is that uh, we have an administration that doesn't believe in global warming, mm -hmm. that is going the EPA, even going in the map, which is in a way quick of your response to, right? Um, so uh, how do we change uh, how do we change it? Because we need to change that whether we like it or not, most of the funding is gonna come from the federal government. Mm -hmm. And how do we get them to support green policy? Because not everything can be done with private partnerships. So, so this is uh, that's actually a really good question, and, and the reason I keep using the words and the term sustainable development goals is because, um, among other reasons, I, I worked in Missouri, the epicenter of climate climate deniers in the United States, uh, the Midwest, uh, for four years as a researcher on communicating conservation issues, and one of the things that I learned is that 
if nothing else, this has to become a respectful conversation. And it has to become a conversation not about the negative of something, but about the positive of something. And when you talk about climate change, one of the funny things about the discussion about climate change is that the opposite of climate change is not climate change. But what have you added to society in that process? Whereas when you're talking about sustainable development, and particularly the sustainable development goals, every time that I talk to somebody in the place that I work in, about, do you like the education of your family to be better? Would you like better water? Would you like a better service of energy that is more efficient, like she's discussing? Would you like to have, the, the frame of sustainable development is a frame about opportunity, it's a frame about, about growth, it's a frame about coming together, and it's a frame about moving forward. So we don't really, I mean, I don't want to get into the controversy of do we talk about climate change or not, but for practical strategic reasons, that is not the discussion right now. The discussion right now is what are the building blocks of moving forward and what are the building blocks of the world when it works and when it's, when it's uh, when we get our act together. And, and that's not a negative usually. That's usually a positive. So I think there is a lot of um, optimism. I'm very optimistic because I think there are ways of having this conversation without getting into the weeds of these controversies that have been artificially created to get us to not do anything. Um, it actually, well, you know, you, you made the point that I was wanting to make, which is that it's not about recovery and being and then sustainability. It's already put that back, that the sustainable, the vision of sustainability is the, is the lens through which recovery happens at every point. So that beginning with the end in mind, that end in mind, then all of the various, the, the diverse, um, you know, avenues of addressing the issue is, is all directed toward that common. Um, and I think that, that one other element of um, the bettering, uh, that that's the, the sustainable development uh, framework allows is, it's also in the, in the long term, you know, cost efficient. I mean, if that's the language that the administration gets, right? That we're talking about cost efficiency of not having to um, spend six billion dollars in a recovery um, after another hurricane happens, then that's the language we need to connect to, because it is more cost efficient to do an energy grid that uses um, sustainable uh, sources than not than coal. Um, and so on. So then I think also those of us on um, on this side of the of the issue um, need to get comfortable with with having some monetary analysis mm -hmm. that connects with the climate change language, mm -hmm. so that we're not we're not talking on two different sides, but we have to get comfortable with the economics of it and say no, this is more economical. This is more cost efficient. In both the short term and the long term, so then we can have a conversation about that. Okay, listen. I think we we are going to have a few other questions, uh, but it's twelve fifteen. My, do, do you know the is the yeah what? Lunch begins at twelve twenty five. Yes. So I'm not. I don't. I don't want people to start leaving. What I want. What I propose is. Um, did you write down your name and and please and contact you all? Just please do that. But I think we can continue. You know, we have a very strong group and very diverse. And I think it are definitely going to help us. This group could actually be something. Yeah, we are something. Really, I mean, really that many different okay we have we have jessica and um Jessica, and uh let's see i i want to make sure we don't you know we, we actually have lunch and yeah just be brief let's be brief and the thing the other the other suggestion that i have is to for you to write down your questions and then we can continue the conversation online yeah, I, I wanted to piggyback a little bit on what Ruth mentioned and and what um, Adrian was mentioning. He said, like, building interventions now that set us forward the future. But it's tied to what Ruth mentioned about the energy literacy and education. Um, that was one of the things that the diaspora is very key. Like, when Irma was going through, like, 
And then Miss Puerto Rico, that's when I could keep started thinking of like, there's things, there's research that has been already been done about how to empower small communities with mm -hmm. solar energy. Mm -hmm. So we have access to that research in advance, so our island doesn't become an experiment. And through that, we created the list, which is democratized, so it's public for anyone. Mm -hmm. You can either support a organization, but mm -hmm. the idea is that it's not just something that you send, you educate it. It goes along with a conversation with the community. So it is, my point is like, there's things that are happening already here with multiple groups, and we need to go back, like, like they were mentioning before, like, instead of trying to re reinvent the wheel, like really create connections on um, how can we make this already existing um, grassroots groups in the island that are already in collaboration with grassroots in, in the diaspora to make them stronger through bigger organizations like yours. Mm -hmm. um, so it's like these things are already happening in the micro. So my, my question perhaps is like how can we further beyond just passing the list, like how, how can we further really engage in a macro way to affect and Congress policy and to affect for the future that when we get another cure again, we're not asking for 10 batteries, we're sending solar stuff. Mm -hmm. Because that's why we were like, no, batteries are gonna become waste. Mm -hmm. Bottles of water are gonna become waste. Mm -hmm. So we focus on sending filters with reusable bottles. Mm -hmm. um, we focus on sending energy that it's solar and it doesn't become waste. So that's the other issue. The waste issue in Puerto Rico mm -hmm. is massive. <laughs> just like you know, just addressing that, which wasn't addressed mm -hmm. yet. But yeah. you know, all that stuff has got to go yeah. where? Mm -hmm. Where is all that stuff? Yeah, no, it's, the, it's what uh, Ruth mentioned the realization that uh, Puerto Rico is an island. You know, yeah. we, we have to think, um, and also the solutions have to be uh, with that in mind. You know, uh, we have to be off the grid and hopefully reducing uh, recycling. We're the going now. It's landfill, actually, right? It's going to landfills, yeah. to the creeks, yeah. yeah. everywhere. Yeah. I mean, right now we, yeah. Well, I mean, like the, the debris that they are cleaning up and okay. clean up the So okay. debris, we are um, segregating into like vegetation and normal like debris, like big ones. Right. And then we are disposing those into this um, landfill. <laughs> and vegetation, we're doing our best to uh, create mulch. And, right. you know, but there's still efforts to build incinerators, right? You know, so that's out. I don't, I don't know what the plan, the plans are for those. Uh, we again, we are in the process of um, providing the first uh, response. If, if um, before we close, uh, if I might do a public announcement. Uh, Part of the reason for being here is again that we're putting together a practical course at the Yale School of Forestry mm -hmm. on the recovery towards sustainable development in Puerto Rico. And so we're trying to pair students with projects in Puerto Rico. So if you have any information or anything that, that you can help us connect students at, these are graduate students from the School of Forestry. And again, we have an amazing variety and diversity of disciplines that are represented there. So if there's anything that you're doing or that you're involved in that might benefit from having a scholar or a student that has some expertise in a particular area of environment, be involved, let us know because we'll be happy to. It's a, it's an ex a, a perfect example. When I was in, you know, when, when Maria spoke us, we, you know, I had no connection with, this is the last time Okay. <laughs> we are okay. okay. Uh, uh, I didn't have anyone. Uh, all of my contacts, I didn't have communication with them. I didn't have access to Wi Fi through the Foundation for Puerto Rico. And so I was like, who oh, should I call? And then I thought about Adrián Teresa, who was in Connecticut, and he was able to, to help us uh, put together the first uh, paper on the cost of, you know, of cleaning this mess. Um, please write down your names, um, your questions if you have other questions, and then we will, I, I'm, I'm committed to, to actually email you back and then update you all. And just you know, the last one to my end, I think of right now because a lot of people, and I say from personal experience as well as from everything I hear, 
people are desperate to help, and we realize that. And one of the things that is the most frustrating is what is the best way to help right now. And I think the great thing that has come out of this from every every area, from environmental, like Echo Kids has done a tremendous job, is that there is a huge power. People have taken it upon themselves to move, even though the government might be doing this effort. We've seen really the power of the people come out of this. I think though, and, and one of the things that is being done tremendously by Brenda, by you know, um, the group here, Ruth, by Adrian, we need to, if we were not here, we're not active before, if we were, we're not um, following the issues in Congress right now, one of the things that Brenda's hoping that Brenda and everyone in the Congress is hoping that would be, the conversation is gonna take us to more conversations so that there is a relief package that will not only address the, as you were saying, that it would not only address the emergency, it will address what we can do. And I think we're in a really good position to be able and you know, long term and sustainable and take this opportunity to do that, to be transparent, not be experimented on. But we need, you know, those of us who have been in Washington who know Congress, it's all about being being having a group of people calling, being activated, because that's extremely important. And I think from the local level, and for all of you who have connections or working with local organizations like Para Naturaleza, like any of the others, I've talked to the president of Para Naturaleza. We need to come together also within the NGO community to talk to each other, to know what everyone is doing, and to address this in unison at the same time that we're, you know, all of us have different areas and diversity is extremely important. But I encourage everyone here too to really push. To for you know for a service for, for you as our uh, agencies over there, but for the local organizations over there to really come together. So yeah, yeah, I just want that's, to that's key. That's going to be key. That's going to make an, a, a real impact. Ruth, do you want to say the last few words? Yeah, um, sure. I mean, just I wanted to mention that someone asked about the incineration projects and yeah. PREPA Integrated Resource Plan does envision the Odyssey One incinerator and also um, uh, another possible uh, similar installation. And um, what we're doing in El Puente and with the communities that um, form the coalition against the uh, AES coal ash waste is arguing that we, you know, the landfills in Puerto Rico don't have the airspace to handle even the coal ash that AES is currently generating and much less the kind of, uh, the amounts of, you know, residuals and waste that the incineration, uh, garbage incineration would generate. And um, just in closing, um, I know people are very concerned about how, how to, um, you know, uh, about, and I, I would say um, we, we we definitely um, count on the diaspora here in Puerto Rico. Uh, we are uh, definitely relying on um, you to help us promote the vision that we have to transform our electric grid in a way that is logical and using the local resources and not keep draining the Puerto Rico economy of two to three billion dollars per year to purchase fossil fuels and the like. Um, and um, the local initiatives that we're working with, like Coqui Solar in Salinas, uh, which is to start with a community center, but eventually uh, do a solar community, the first solar community among the, the people that have been most impacted by fossil fuel generation in Puerto Rico because we have such a high concentration of it here. Um, but there are obviously other initiatives that I've heard of that uh, where people are trying to establish solar communities and um, also, uh, you know, support solar installations for schools, for example, um, so that so the kids, you know, the majority of our kids are still not um, being able to go to school because of the lack of energy primarily. Thank you. Great, thank you um, for joining and thank you everyone.